Lord, folks, as we stand to our feet this morning for the word of the Lord, and then you can stand and if you got your sword, your, your Bible, or your Bible app with you today, we want to stand in honor of God's word, which is our custom, and it is symbolic of us saying to the Lord that, Father, we honor your word more than we honor our word. We honor what you are saying, God, more than what people are saying. So maybe you'll do that in your home. You know, maybe you over the kitchen stove at the moment. Or maybe you're in the refrigerator making you a ham sandwich. <clears throat> just take for a moment and pause and just say, I, I stand in anticipation for what God would say to me and what God would say to my family. And, and I do hope you understand that, that God never speaks to just one. Regardless of your family makeup or your family dynamics, you may be the one here listening, you may be the one there watching but God is not just talking to you. The Bible says that David said, uh, God has spoken once, but yet twice have I heard it. That power belongs to God because God has a way of speaking and it echoes through generations. He speaks, watch, he speaks in one room and every room in the house heard it. He spoke in the living room, but everybody in the bedrooms and the kitchen, they heard it. Somebody needed to just say, God, may your word reverberate today. Lord, I am very humbled to stand before your people today to utter forth what we believe we've heard in the spirit. Father, we, the series you've given us, SOS, Strengthening Our Ships, we've spent great time dealing with and talking through worship. And Lord, today we begin to narrow our focus on relationships. Father, many of us in here today have had a broken relationship in the midst of a broken relationship, have had strong relationships, maybe in the midst of strong relationships. Lord, I ask you to sit us down by the fire, stir our hearts to wisdom, Stir our minds to the counsel of the Most High. As we are challenged today, listen church, listen closely church. As we are challenged today, don't you dare run from this word. As God lays out his protocol and his examples don't you dare shy away from it, move back from it. But may we, like communion, eat ye all of it. May we consume all of your truth today, God. May we consume all of your revelation today. I end my way. What God is about to say to us, he's not talking to your child. He's not talking to your mama or your daddy. He's not talking to your brother or your sister. He's not speaking to your husband or to your wife. God is talking to you. Watch this. With the loud voice. Say, Father, you're talking to me today. Now watch this. One more again. God, you're talking to me today. Jesus' name. Watch this. Go touch five people and tell them, say, God is talking to me today.
as you make your way back to your seats today. Uh, church, I do want to, I want to have like a kingdom conversation with you today. While it is undeniable that there will probably be preaching moments, I really just want to have a kingdom conversation with you today. And let me ask you, is, um, is, anyone, is anyone in here, your heart is broken when you look at certain relationships? You know, my mom and dad got divorced when I was 18, and um, I was so selfish, y'all. So selfish. My mom was so bad what was going on in our home, and um, I'll tell you, apart from my wife and daughters, my mom is absolutely the strongest woman that I know, and she endured so much. And when she came to me as the oldest boy of me and of my mom and my dad and she said I'm gonna have to leave your father and I just begged my mom please mom please please mom please don't leave my daddy mama look at so many families around us look at He said, I can't take it anymore. I don't know, not, not quite a year after my mom and dad got a divorce, my dad was murdered. And some years later, the Lord gave my mom the most wonderful man. And you guys have heard my testimony. I gave that man hell for a while because nobody was going to replace my daddy. And I made sure he knew it until a time that God came and broke my heart for what he was doing. And see, when you hurt, you can't see relationships properly. And God can have the best thing in front of you. He could have put the best thing beside you. But your hurt only lets you see an enemy. Your hurt only allows you to see competition. It doesn't allow you to see help. I'm going to give you a pop quiz right now. Take out your phone or take out a piece of pen and paper, if you, whatever you write with. And uh, here's, the, here's the pop quiz. I want 100% participation. On a scale of 1 to 10, how well are you doing with your relationships today? Don't make it complex, you know. Well, sir, what relationships? I said relationships. How well, I didn't say how well are they going. How well are you doing with the relationships in your life? Scale of one to 10. You write down a number. Nobody really knows that number but you and God right now. Maybe somebody put an eight or a nine. Maybe somebody put a two or a three. Maybe someone is around a five or a six. Here's the next question in the quiz. What relationships in your life need the most work? Write that down, please. What relationships in your life need the most work? And for some of you, this is so healing if you allow it because 
you got to admit some things. You got to acknowledge some things. You got to confess some things. Maybe the relationship that needs the most work is that relationship between you and your dad. Maybe that relationship that needs the most work is that relationship between you and your pastor. Maybe that relationship that needs the most work is between you and your son-in-law. Maybe that relationship that needs the most work is between you and your supervisor. Maybe that relationship that needs the most work is between you and that brother that came out of the same womb, grew up in the same house, and ate at the same table. But it's the relationship that needs the most work today. And I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't move in areas you won't acknowledge. God just going to have to work that out. No, he won't. It sounds good to say that, though, doesn't it? Because it sounds good when we, God is in control, and God does what he wants to do. So what? All of these, I mean, all of this murder, all of this racial injustice, all of this sex trafficking, all of this, and, but God is doing what he wants to do. Stop saying that. It's not true. God does what we permit him to do to the extent that we would allow him Acknowledge what relationship or ships need the most work right now in your life. Those relationships that need the most work. Here's the next question. I only got one more. What is the core issue? in those relationships. What's the core issue? It's most likely more than one, depending upon the relationships there, but write down, what's some of the core issues in those relationships that need the most work? Please write plainly, write candidly. This is what you know, Holy Spirit, right now, you, and, and, and listen, you can't, l- You can't lie before God. If I was asking everybody to come up here and and show everybody, you might put something different. But because this is between you and the Father right now, be as honest as you can. What's the core issue? Most of the time when people sit down, when I sit down with people, people sit down with me, Pastor Will, the core issue is never the first thing that's brought up. It's every other issue. It's the peripheral issues. It's the, the, the emotional issues. It's the, the issues of feeling. But no, what's the core? Feelings aside, emotions aside, what's the core issue? Now you get into a place where God can prepare to pour oil in that area because I've evaluated my state of relationships. I've identified, uh, I've identified what relationships are now needing the most work. I've acknowledged the core issues in those relationships. Now, hallelujah, these last two questions. Be honest. What did you do to make these relationships like that? Don't get writer's block now. And baby cakes, see, for some, it feels so good to say baby cakes in here and see you looking at me right here, baby. Baby cakes, it's, see, that's, that's real because somebody in here or out there, in their core issue, they wrote down things regarding the other person. I'm asking you now by the Spirit of God 
what did you do to put this relationship in this state that's in, that's in right now? Before we go to the last question and before we look at anything else, I want to know how honest can you be and say, what did you do? How did you contribute? How did you participate in this relationship now being in the state that it is in right now? Whether it's with your supervisor, your brother, your sister, your spouse, your children, whether it's with an auntie or an uncle, whether it's a, what did you do? And can I tell you something? This right here, nobody knows but you and God right now. This right here is whether we know whether you're walking by faith or not. Because we can talk faith. We can talk about how anointed, gifted we are, how much we love the Lord. But when the Lord comes and asks us for an honest assessment of where I am and how I'm doing with what he has given unto me, don't be Adam and don't be Eve who both lied. God said, what's going on with your house? What's going on with your relationships? Adam said, Ugh, it's the woman. God goes to the woman. She said, Ugh, yeah, that serpent. Neither Adam didn't say, you know, God, you told us not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You told us not to eat. And Lord, we ate of it. Lord, I'm telling you, the reason I was hiding is because I messed up. I sinned. He did not give an honest evaluation. Can I tell you something? Me, yeah. When you refuse to give an honest evaluation, an eviction will follow. Somebody tweet that one. Put that on your page. See if you get some extra followers. Because nobody accepted their part in the play. God judged all of them. Judged Adam, judged Eve, judged the serpent. I mean, all of them got judgment. And this, if it were, this place called Eden that it took six days to help set up and create. In a moment, God evicted them out of it. And he's just like, God, but you made all of this stuff for me and for us. And he said, but clearly you don't want it. So let me ask the question again. What are some things that you've done, some behaviors you've had, some thoughts you've thought, some words you've said to why the relationship is the way that it is? And let me just tell you something, and this is strong, and I speak up here, amen, as a father to you. If you're not honest with this question right here, forget about the rest of the message I'm about to deliver. David said something in the book of Psalms. He said, you know, Lord, against thee and thee only have I sinned. I acknowledge that before I hurt anybody, before any other relationship tries to be repaired, restored, or made right, I got to get right with you. The context of that is not David saying, I sinned against you, God, and no, because David sinned against Bathsheba. David sinned against Uriah. David sinned against the nation because he was king. I mean, D David sinned against a lot of people. But in order of priority relationships, Father, against thee and thee only have I sinned. If I don't get it right with you, I can't expect nothing to get right over here. And we're going we're gonna to talk through that some here today so one more time you don't want me to ask you but one more time what did you do I think one translation that's actually what what God said Adam what did you do like there ain't a lot of people to blame here right now what did you do I left you in charge What did you do for that relationship between you and your mom to be like that? What did you do for that relationship between you and your dad? What did you do for that relationship between you and your spouse? What did you do for that relationship between you and a coworker? What did you do? What did you do? And, 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 and the oil from God to begin to repair and restore relationships follows the honest confession. Nathan, the senior prophet, chief prophet, head prophet, 
till the royalty showed up to David and told him a story about a man that had a farm and uh, um, had some lambs and some sheep in his farm and he had all of this but yet he wanted somebody else's and he took amen that which belonged to somebody else's this man's only one and David was so upset as he began to hear this story this parable and David said that man deserves judgment how could he do such a thing and before I move forward for a moment ladies and gentlemen this is partly when you know that someone has the heart of God, listen carefully to, to this. Because see, some people can be in sin, and while they're in sin, they're loving the sin so much, they no longer judge it. See, as long as I accept it, it will stay with me. So now watch this now. David at this point didn't even know that Nathan was giving him a parable about himself. But watch how mad he was. In other words, he wasn't like though he was off with Bathsheba and doing and took Uriah's only wife. Right? David was still like, this, this is unjust. This is wrong. And I want to just tell somebody for a moment, I take this the right way. You can have people out there doing bad things and their heart is closer to God than people out there doing good things. Follow the rest of the story. Nathan then looks at David and said, the very man you upset with, you are the man. David went into mourning. David went into repentance. Psalms 51, 52, 53, Psalms 57 where David lays out his sin and what he's done and how he's done it. I mean, he laid it out. Watch this now. It's, it, when he became honest, he began to get to a place where he could receive healing. There's relationships that are suffering in your life because there's no honesty in them. I'm a facade. I'm a fake. I'm going to act like I love you. I'm act like I'm going to be there for you. Now, let's continue the quiz and finish it up. The last question. How are you going to trust God to repair that relationship? This is something that you need to give an answer to. How are you going to trust God to repair that relationship? Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard me say this before, and it sounds kind of kind of strange, but it's so it's so true and so valuable. Listen to me. Every relationship doesn't matter. Every relationship doesn't matter. And I feel like I'm going to be saying this all service. I love y'all. Many of us, the relationships that matter the most suffer because the relationships that matter less get all the attention. If you put every relationship on the same level, number one, you're going to meet Jesus sooner than you want to. Number two, your life is going to be at a level to where you are consistently empty. Because none of us were built, created, birthed to manage our relationships at the same level. Jesus had the, he had the three, he had the 12, he had the 72, he had the 3,000. He had his, his brothers and sisters, we know that. He had his mom, he had his dad, he had the church folk, he had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but none of them were all on the same level. His mama and brothers came to him at one time and he was like, tell them who is my mother and my brothers, but these that are doing the will of the Lord. 
it immediately he put a priority over one relationship over the other. And can I be honest with you for a moment? We do poorly with that because if we feel deprioritized, we feel disrespected. But can I tell you something? Maybe if somebody deprioritized you in a moment or in a season, it's because of something else that they needed to reprioritize. Allow them to reprioritize that even though they had to drop your name down on the list. But you know what? We're so fragile. We're so fragile. We're so fragile. They called you back, but they didn't call me back. Get over yourself. But God says the same thing that may have happened to you, you got to do to others. You got to, be able to, you got to be able to load balance every day. Some relationships deserve a little bit more. We, we try to do this with our family meetings, with our daughters. Like, hey, guys, well, you know, pressure's going on a little bit more this week. She got this going on, that going on. We need to extend more love to her this week, more grace to her this week. Check in on her more. Hey, Jasmine got this going on. We asking people, look, the family, let's begin to divert more energy and more efforts over here because she got this going on, this, that, and the other. It can't be the same thing every day and in every moment and every situation. But to the ones that matter, you're able to communicate it openly so everybody knows it's not that I don't love you. I just can't talk to you as much this week. And I know some of what I'm saying right now, we never heard this before. And depending upon the structures we were raised in, it was if we've become so... I judge your love for me by how much you do what I want you to do. And so now when you don't do what I want you to do, you don't love me. And that whole teaching that somebody gave to you is wrong. And so now why do our relationships get in this place? Because we got all these narratives. One of the first things we do when my wife and I were taking couples through counseling we, is let's define love. Because of how this man was raised, he defines love totally different. When you say I love you and he says he loves you, y'all said the same thing and it can mean two totally different things. How are you going to trust God to repair those relationships? Every relationship doesn't matter. So every relationship doesn't need to be repaired. But there is some, it is monumentally critical that it is repaired. Pastor Will talked us through the first family, Cain and Abel how it must have broken their parents' heart to see children, their children bickering. And then that bickering to lead to the death of one, which really means you lost both children. For a pastor, a shepherd, to see his flock fighting amongst each other, and the same ones that fight amongst each other say how much they love their pastor, but they're breaking their pastor's heart. There's common, what I call or could be called everyday relationships, right? Just a common everyday relationship. There's uh, work or uh, 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 career uh, relationships. There's family relationships. There's ministry relationships. And I'm just calling, I won't, this is not an all exhaustive list, but I want you to kiss this out, kiss this for a moment. Those, those are some of the, some, 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 some of the relationships. But, 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 then, but then there are what I call higher, hierarchical relationships. And these are what I call destiny relationships. And another way that you've heard me say this is covenant relationships. Now, go back to your quiz, go back to your exam, go back to this pop quiz. When you wrote down the relationships that are in need of the most work, 
which category do they fall in? You just said that there's some relationships that require the most work that have core issues. I'm now asking you, is it the common everyday relationship? Is it the work or the career relationship? Is it the family relationship? Is it a ministry relationship? Or is it a destiny or covenant relationship? See, I'm helping you prioritize your energy. Don't spend all your time trying to repair something that's common in every day. There's other relationships that is gonna need more of your energy, more of your time, more of your drive, more of your forgiveness, more of your compelling. Like, like you have to be more compelling. It, it, I can't just, you didn't get it. We're not, we at odds, we're not talking, and then I just leave it and let it go. No, no, because this relationship means too much. This relationship means too much. Can I follow up with you? Can I take you for a cup of coffee? Can I, can I, can I take you to breakfast? Can I swing by your home? Because this relationship, it means too much. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, through experience here, through anointing and gifting, absolutely, and through revelation, I'm teaching these principles to you. About nine years ago, we did a series in this house here called The People Factor. Many of you weren't even here during that time. Some of you were, but many of you were not. And we spent, I don't know, three months on just educating people to understand, like, like some things, like, that's the devil. No, it's not. That's just people. It's the people factor. And if you knew a little bit more about where they were from, you would understand why that's why they behaved that way. It's not an enemy. It's not a demon. No, instead of going pulling out the anointing oil, pull out your, <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Go shake their hand and take them out for lunch and sit down and make things better. It's not the devil. It, that's not something you need to come and lay on your face about and say, God, are you doing something about God? I said, no, that's, that's, that's people's in, in intuitions. That's, that, that's, that's how it flows. That's the, the, how you negotiate the reality of living with somebody who's imperfect. Can I go a little further? I didn't put romantic relationships, but that should have been up there as well. Romantic or intimate relationships, you can add that. Andrew drew up here on the board th these arrows here, and, and it speaks to us for a moment. It really takes all of these relationships, and it begins to put them, a certain arrow, if you would, You got your horizontal relationships. You have your vertical relationships. But then you also got your diagonal, which means veering. These are the relationships that they kind of go sideways and up and down, right? Th these are the ones that they, they, they span. They're not all horizontal they're not all vertical but it's diagonal now now if you are if you want to become a student of this series and a student of this message today around relationships take all of your key relationships in your life your key relationships and make them fit on an arrow either it's a horizontal relationship it's a vertical relationship or it's a diagonal relationship every relationship is is, is going to fall in this category and and now watch this now watch the arrows watch the arrows watch these arrows for a second watch these arrows for a second because listen 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 guys gals every relationship that you're in is either taking you up or it's taking you down every relationship you're in is taking you out or it's bringing you in every relationship 
But come on, before we begin to look at the relationship itself or the other people that are in the relationship, you must understand you are doing that to somebody. You're either bringing somebody down or you're bringing them up. You're either helping somebody step into something new or you are dragging them backwards to who they used to be. So maybe, maybe, maybe Minister Jen, maybe as we're filling this, this arrows in here, maybe we need to put, where are we on this arrow diagram? I'm going to tell you now, I refuse to drag somebody down. I refuse to take somebody back. Come on, old stuff is for the devil. If I'm a part of anyone's life, work life, common everyday relationship, amen, only one romantic relationship, amen, family relationship, ministry relationship, or anything else, amen, if, if I'm in your life, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, maybe every once in a while of that, but I can promise you, we ain't going back, we ain't going down, and we ain't going over. Well, watch this. You have to make up your mind. Watch this. Hallelujah. Okay. What is it like living with you? Now, this is right here when everybody just begins to look forward and look straight and don't, <laughs> no movement, no, no subtle movement. Watch this. We don't think about that. We don't think about wh what it's like to live with you. One of the things that I don't know with 100% assurity, but I know a good bit of how difficult and heavy it is for me to be their dad along with their two other sisters and for me to be her husband. I know I'm not the easiest guy to live with, be married to. But you know what? I think I'm better than. <laughs> I think I'm better than, what's the song we sing, sweetheart? You know that all of my good days outweigh my bad days. I'm, we have more good days then we do bad days, but I wanna, I'm teaching you something. We don't take enough time to evaluate. I can be a whole lot sometimes. Amen. You know what? I can be petty sometimes. You know what? I can get on your nerves. You know what? Yes, we have talked about this, and why am I still dealing with it? But we want to get better at relationships, not until you evaluate the cost of what it is even to be with you. And that's in any form of the relationship. What is it like to interact with you? What is it like to, to be, I've had to learn and still learning how to throttle down. Because by nature, I'm an amped up guy, by nature. So it's easy for me to go from zero to 60 in 1.5 nanoseconds. It's easy. It's normal for me to do that. I can go from here to there and like done left everybody in the dust. But I've had to learn. Jamie, be a Prius today. I'm helping us with relationships. As long as you begin to get up every morning and say, well, this is just how I am. This is how God made me. You will stay that way. This is just how I am. I'm sorry. You knew I was like this before you married me, but I didn't think you was going to stay like that, Lord. When it comes to relationships, you must change. I know you want to be the Lamborghini. You want to be the, 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 the souped up, amen, teched out, amen, just no sports car, amen. You want the twin turbo. You want the dual exhaust. What is? And God said, but you know what? I need you, watch this, for the next month, I need you to be, amen, I, I don't know. <laughs> I want to say some stuff, but I can't say what I want to say. Amen. I need you to be an automobile that struggles to get to 60. 
instead of one that can go from zero to 60 in a moment. She was just trying to have a conversation with you and you're already at 60. He was just trying to bring something up and you already off the cliff. You already see, you're, you're talking over them. You, don't, you, already, you think you already know where they're going because you went from zero to 60. Slow yourself down. Become a dump truck. Drive 15 miles an hour so you can listen and learn and glean before you accelerate. Can I keep going? Now for a moment, I don't know if I can do this or not. The most dangerous relationships, the most destructive of relationships, the most exhausting of a relationship. Those relationships that are one way. There's no reciprocal benefit. I'm always the one paying. I'm always the one staying late. And I know you, you all know that you don't say things like conclusive statements like always, but for the sake of this analogy here, I'm the one that's giving in. I'm the one that's giving up. I'm the one that's having to change. I'm the one that's having to this. I'm the one that's having that. While the other person just sits back and says, watch this now, whether, regardless of the type of relationship it is, so it can be any of these, romantic, ministry, family, it can be destiny, it can be whatever. The Apostle Paul talks about even from the shepherd to the sheep, about how those, when the ministry of the word goes forth, that the sheep should find a way to reciprocate back to the teacher. And, you know, we will go, man, and we'll just drain the woman of God. We'll just drain the man of God. Oh, what a good word. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh, that's so wonderful. But I never really reciprocated the value and the truth with which you've shared, with which you've released unto me. The Bible says, muzzle not the ox while it's treading out the grain. It says again that the, 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 the laborer is worthy of his hire. So there should, there, there should be reciprocal, regardless of the type of relationship it is. Amen. There should be something emotional. Amen. It is sometimes psychological. Other times it is tangible and physical because I want you to understand I'm not going to be a thief and a robber in my own house. I'm not going to be a thief and a robber in the house of God. Amen. So I, I make you breakfast and it doesn't have to be Mother's Day. I send you to the spa or the salon and it doesn't have to be your birthday. I'm, I, come on, I bought you this husband and it doesn't have to be Father's Day because I want to reciprocate to you on an ongoing basis of the value that you mean to me. And God, we live in a world of thieves and robbers we take we take we take we steal we steal we steal and as soon as somebody asks you anything why we got to give to them well good lord how much have you been receiving and you wonder why there's just such exhaustion and such frustration and such emotional baggage and it's because everybody in the house is stealing from each other Relationships that matter the most, they can't just be one way. They must be bi-directional. It must be two-way. It must be you give and you receive. And it's not like nobody measures that, right? We understand 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. We understand love doesn't count wrongs. So it's not like I gave today, so you're going to give tomorrow. But it should be a, a, a harmony and a balance that we both understand that this relationship, whatever category it is, it is a give and it is a take. It is a, we have trade-offs. We have trade-offs. And so I really didn't want to do this today, but because I'm with you and you really want to do that thing, 
I know how to die to myself. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm now giving you an incredible truth. I mean, an absolute incredible truth that I do not see play out in as many instances as, as any of us would like to see. And that is this right here. When you love someone, when you're in a relationship with someone, regardless of the category, fellow brother, fellow sister, amen, parent, whatever it looks like, when you're in a relationship with someone, you should care about what they care about so you can care about it. But let's be honest, in our relationships, Kelvin, it's what I care about. And you should have knew that I care about that. And because you didn't care about what I wanted you to care about, I'm not going to care about what you want me to care about. And I'm about to make a whole lot of people mad in here right now. Security, if you can secure all the doors and God says, son, you got to talk through this because my people are lost in the sauce when it comes to relationships. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all thy getting, getting understanding. How are you going to make things better when you don't even understand the person you're trying to make things better with? How about I do more trying to understand you, trying to understand you, trying to understand you. I want to understand where Sister Jacqueline is coming from. What's her heartbeat on that matter? What's her perspective on that matter? Okay, now I know why she feels so deeply about that. Before I try to give an opinion, before I try to change her, before I try to put my load on her. So now I'm helping you with the last question that I asked you in your pop quiz. How are you going to trust God to repair some of those relationships? That is, God, help me to understand this person more that I'm in a relationship with. Because when I get understanding, I become unstoppable. When I get understanding, when I understand your proclivities, when I understand why you didn't respond that way or why you did respond that way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Understanding is what begins to repair relationships because when you begin to understand, now you can extend mercy and you can extend grace because I understand. I understand. I understand now. Oh, no, don't worry about what I know. I know I said that yesterday, but you know what? Forget about that. I, I understand where you're coming from. God help us in here today. And see, the thing is, though, Deacon Presley, I would rather you understand me than me try to understand you. You heard Apostle on Sunday. You need to be doing all you can to try to understand me. <laughs> Apostle didn't say that. We should be seeking every day. The Bible says to men, dwell with your wives according to understanding, according to knowledge. That's how you can live together. If you don't bring your understanding and knowledge to the table, feelings and emotions will dictate everything that you do. I'm not going no more. Feeling. I'm out of here. Feeling. You didn't do this. Feeling. And God said, well, man, why do we talk about being led by the Spirit? Most of the relationships that are failing today is because they are feeling driven. Please send that to your 2.5 million followers. <laughs> Most of the relationships that are failing today are failing because they are driven by feelings. Elder Hills, <clears throat> welcome back to the United States of America, by the way. <laughs> We look forward to you and Sister Ida sharing of all the goodness that you guys had. I'm, I'm glad that they couldn't keep y'all, that y'all that were able to make your way back. But Elder Hills, for a moment, Auntie, I'm married to your niece. 
and it was about maybe three years into our marriage. We were making our way back from South Carolina, back to Kansas. And my wife got so sick on the road, was driving 26 hours. My wife got so sick. This was that I can recall maybe one of the first big sicknesses that one of us had in our marriage. And we finally made it home and my wife's in the bed and we went to urgent care or ER and came back home and medicine and she just balled up in the bed. And I remember sitting on the edge of the bed absolutely helpless. I'm sitting on the end of the bed and, and I'm just like, everything that I know to do, I've done it and nothing is better. Listen here, church. I said, you know who's gonna know what to do? Her mama. And I remember calling her mom. I said, I've done this and I've done this and we tried this one. And her mom said, you know, praise God for remedies of a mother. I can't tell you, I can't remember exactly what the remedy was, but it was boil this, buy this, put this in it, sprinkle that, and, and whatever it was, and, and, and let, her, let her take that and then do this with the stomach and then do this and this. And this. The Lord said, Jamie, this is what it means to be married. Her pain has to become your pain. You can't give somebody your vow and then when you don't have no more answers, I wish I could take y'all to that moment. I can still see it so vividly. The time will come that God says, you're going to have to ante up to this relationship that you said that you was going to be in. It's time for you to pony up, ante up. No, no, there's no passing the buck. There's no this. There's no that. This is your problem as much as it is their problem. There is no dismissing. There is no certificate of divorce. There is no putting away. There is no this. It's y'all and y'all in it together. If all you can do is curl up in the bed with her and put your arm around her, then you do that. But you're in it together. Pardon me for being in marriage retreat mode. What problems have arisen in relationships that you allow the problem to dictate whether you stay in the relationship? And God says, are, are, you, are you superficial? Now that a real problem exists, I need, this is where you hunker down. This is where you, where you lock in. This is where you begin to man up and woman up. This is not when you cash in your chips. One of the, one of the pandemics that has swept by our nation and, and even more so probably over the last five to six years is what is called cancel culture. Oh, I don't like what you just said. Oh, we canceling you. Yeah, podcast no more. Yeah, we're not playing that song no more. Yeah, we're not letting you teach on this no more. Yeah, we're not doing it. And, and, and guess what? It has come right into the church. Or you treat me like this, I'm canceling you. Watch this. Here's why I'll spend the remainder of my, my little time that I have. I want to talk for a moment about the highest, write this down, the highest forms and the greatest expectations of any relationship. The highest form and the greatest expectation of any relationship. Audio video, if y'all don't mind, Romans 12 and verse 18. Pastor Joanna, 
the highest form and the greatest expectations of any relationship. I got so much good stuff to give y'all, but God said, Jamie, look, set the bar first. If it be possible, as much as what depends on you, stay right here, live peaceably with all men. The highest form and the greatest expectation for any relationship you have is that it will be a relationship of peace. We can see things differently, Elder Matlock. We can come from two different perspectives we can we can have strong opinions that are different but we must continue to be brothers of peace we must continue to be men of peace and ladies and gentlemen somebody needed to tell us this that i can i can disagree with my mom or dad but still be committed that this will be a peaceful relationship. That I can have an art with my brother or sister, but I care about the peace between us more than I do me winning an argument. I don't want to win the argument. I just want us to have peace. I don't care about who is right or wrong, but we're going to live peaceably together. highest form and greatest expectation of any relationship is to be one of peace. You need to be at peace with everybody on your row. You need to be at peace with anyone that you work with. You need to be at peace with them. Colleagues, you need to be at peace with them. Your ministry relationship, you need to be at peace with them. Watch this now. Even if they are still struggling with being at peace with you, you've got to have a made up mind that I will be at peace with you. So no, oh, I know they don't like me, so I'm just going to avoid them. That's not being a person of peace. No, they may not like me, whether that's my reality or whether that's my opinion. I can still say, good morning, how you doing? How was your weekend? And they can be as short as they want to be. They can be able to say, you know, well, I'm so glad. I'm so glad to hear that. It's going to be a good day today. Let me know if you need anything, okay? I just sit right over there. But I, really, I, I you must make up your mind I will be a person of peace. Jesus said, Peter, put your sword up. Those that live by the sword will also die by the sword. God is peace. And I'll keep him in perfect peace, whose mind has stayed on me. Can you make that commitment? Watch this now. The, the highest form and greatest expectation of any relationship is to be one of peace. Can I say something that y'all going to really love? And the only person that don't want that is the devil. I was hoping somebody would clap to that. The devil is the only one because any believer is going to want peace. Oh, my, my. Second highest form and greatest expectation of relationship, Micah chapter 6. The prophet Micah chapter 6. I think that's where I want to go. Reading one verse there. Verse 8. Book of, matter of fact, just bring it on back. Just bring, I know, you're taking it off. I know, I know, I know, I know. Because I'm supposed to be sitting in it, so. I struggle. Watch this, guys. And he has shown you, oh man, or woman, what is good. What does the Lord require of us? Sister Carrie Ann, what does the Lord require of us? Anybody, you know, well, what does the Lord want of me? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Why well, didn't did everything I can do? What else does the Lord want me to do? Micah is answering the question for us. Sit back down, Jamie. <laughs> what does the Lord require of you? Do justly. Love mercy. Stay here for a second. Walk humbly with your God. Hey, guys, check this out. Do justly and love mercy. Those don't matter if I'm not in a relationship. Those two things is talking about how we are with other people. And God, for a moment, gives me two requirements of how I interact with other people, and they gave me one requirement of how I interact with him. 
Jamie, in every relationship, make sure you are just. Make sure, watch this now. He didn't say make sure you are right. Make sure you are just because we serve a just God. Be just. That is to be righteous. And what is God's heart on the matter? What is God's mind on the matter? Be just. And it doesn't matter about who's right or who's wrong. You don't take sides. Be just in it. Love mercy. Well, what is it? What, what can mercy do if I'm not extending it to somebody? This is talking about relationships. How many relationships are starving of mercy? Nobody has mercy on nobody. Nobody. Furnace, you're wrong. You did it. I'm blaming you. Get out of my face. Like we, what, like, that, can I ask you a question? Who do we, okay. who do we turn into? Ortiz, we turn into somebody. As soon as something is wrong, like, what happened to that sanctified saint that was at greater faith on Sunday morning? They don't want to talk to me, so I'm going to talk to y'all out there. What happened to that anointed person? But all of a sudden, we turned into someone that God doesn't even recognize. And God said, but you're my son and my daughter. When are you going to extend mercy? I follow the Lord. and The Lord is my God. And it's in him that I serve. Let me ask you a question. Write down, write down 10 people over the last week that you extend mercy to. Relationships are starving for mercy while we just want to be right. Mama, I realize you did the best you could with what you had. Mama, I don't blame you at all. Thank you for what you could provide. You're the best mama I could have ever had. But we find ourselves... We find ourselves lost in how to use those words. Why? Because we've been taught in error that in order to extend mercy, you must deserve it. So when you do something deserving of my mercy, then I will extend my mercy not biblical sounds good feels good and other people are rally around that that's right why yeah you, you don't get, keep giving your mercy no i mean it, it 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 gets people in your corner but no he said here's what i'm asking of you the highest form and the greatest expectation of every relationship is that the relationship is a just relationship that the relationship extends mercy consistently. It is a lifestyle of extending mercy. He says, I want you to love mercy. Even if the person is unlovable, but I love mercy. Come on, somebody. This is the truth that sets us free. Well, I don't want your mercy. I didn't say you had to receive it, but I'm extending mercy to you because of what I stand for and because of who he is to me. Well, I don't have to accept it. That's only because your heart is hard. But my heart is soft enough. I extend mercy to you. The highest form and the greatest expectation of any relationship. Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. Two verse. Uh, this 16. 6 and 16. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. And I'm going to read just a few verses there. Okay, guys, y'all ready? These six things the Lord hates. I 
I got to be honest. In my private time in prayer, I just was like, oh, oh, God, oh, like I was like, God, this, God, this is going to hurt. I mean, like he's giving it to, and I'm just like, Lord, I, I know what I'm feeling right now. I can't even get up off of this floor right now. This, this stuff. He said, Jamie, no, these six things doth the Lord hate, yet seven are an abomination to you. Right when you thought six was too much, he said, no, seven are an abomination to him. And before we read it, go back, go back to 16. Sorry, sorry, guys, go back to 16. Listen, listen, listen. Now, some of y'all know, already know what these things are because you've already read them and studied them and this, that, and the other. Others of y'all, you're on the edge of your seat like, oh, what are they? But listen, <laughs> hate is a strong word. And it's even stronger when God uses it. So now, wait a minute. Micah just told me what he loves and what he wants me to do and how I should interact. Now Solomon here in Proverbs said, let me tell you what the Lord hates in relationships. Let's go now, guys. Verse 17. He hates pride in a relationship. We're so prideful we don't ask for help. We're so prideful. I can't listen to my spouse when they're trying to encourage me to do the things of the Lord, to behave in a certain way. But I'm too prideful. You know why? Because I know you're not perfect. So how are you going to tell me something? That's pride. I hate even the look of pride, God says. Pride in a ministry relationship. Pride in a family relationship that you think you're better than everybody else in the family. He hates pride. He hates a lion tongue in relationships. Listen carefully. Lying to yourself about what you believe and what you think. Lying to others about your part in why things are wrong. He hates a lying tongue. Hands that are innocent or quick to shed innocent blood. You're blaming people that aren't even around. You're, you're bringing in stuff that doesn't even matter anymore. There are innocent and pure. Those that are, those, there are those that are, that are for you. There are those that are around you, and they're getting brought into it. Because you want to get better your own way. Now, folks, there's so much truth that God is releasing here in these moments. You're going to have to go back and probably watch this message like 7,000 times. Because any one of these principles can shift things for the positive in your relationships. Verse 18. A heart. Stay here. That devises wicked plans. So this is now where I sit down and think about how I can do you wrong. I sit down and contemplate how I'm going to get you back for what you did to me. So now I actually ponder. And so now instead of meditating on the goodness of the Lord, instead of meditating on how God, how God can restore and how God can repair, I'm sitting here thinking, how can I do to you what you did to me or whatever it looks like. Feet, stay here for a moment, sir. Feet that are swift and running to do evil. Notice the order there. Because after I ponder that thing, after I think about it, my heart is already made up and now my feet just follow. Your feet don't have a mind. Your hands don't have a mind. They follow your mind and your heart. Well, oh Lord. I don't know how this happened. I can tell you how it happened because you thought about it. And you thought about it for a while because there's no way your feet would have just went in. That's why the Bible says flee the very appearance of evil. Because as soon as I start downloading and thinking, and trying, you know, and how could he, how could she, and, and why did it this way, and why, nah, 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 nah. now your feet say, just tell me when you want me to start walking. Verse 19. He hates a false witness. Somebody else that comes in on the scheme. 
because they're just taking sides. They're not being just a false witness, somebody who wasn't, who wasn't really there, but they act like they were there. This last one here, the one that divides the brethren. Now, Bible scholars, what does the word brethren mean in the Bible? It means church. It means church folk. It means the flock. Anytime you see the word brethren, God is talking about his people. And he's saying the last thing that I hate is someone who brings division amongst my people. Is there anyone here that is doing that today? That you're dividing the people of God. over issues that don't even matter. We read the scripture earlier, in as much as possible, Romans, live at peace with all men. Just two more verses, church, and we'll begin to wrap up here today, but Listen to that for a moment. In as much as possible, in as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. A rumor can get started. And I can say, that's it. They didn't start a rumor on the wrong one. I'm out of here. Or I could say, in as much as is possible with me. They started that rumor, but I'm living in truth. My feet has been planted where the Lord would have me to be. I struggle here sometimes navigating between the pastoral heart and the apostolic mantle that's on my life. But I am amazed at how we can let the words of another person literally remove us from the promises of God. I am astounded. And I am not a novice in ministry. And I am still astounded at how someone's feelings and behaviors could become more important than you than where God has placed you. Blows my mind. But I need you to ask yourself a question. Could that happen to me? How strong are you? How planted are you in the relationships or as I would say the people and the places that God has assigned you to? God assigns us to people and God assigns us to places. How fortified are you in that? that you cannot allow, because it will happen. He says, one who sows discord among the brethren. It will happen. It just says that God hates it. Right, right. I challenge you, single mom, single dad, I challenge you, mamas and daddies in here, I challenge you, husbands and wives in here, is your house prepared to stand up against a divisive spirit? Real talk. You know, so I'm talking with our daughters, you know, it's like, hey, all of y'all are in four different seasons of life. Like one on a doctorate, two on masters, one getting married, one in this relationship, one's pursuing this one. I'm not I said, there'll be people that mean well, and then there'll be those that do not mean well. Oh, Diamond, how do you feel about Jasmine getting married? Well, when are you gonna get married? Well, how you feel about that? Knowingly or unknowingly can bring a divisive spirit. So how are you preparing your house for divisive spirits? Because they will come. 
Oh, I thought you would have been the one doing this. And see, even the person may not even realize how the enemy is using them. How about just saying, I'm so excited for your sister, and I know you are as well. Oh, it's going to be a great, great, I, don't know, I just can't wait to see the wedding. And just leave it there. The enemy will subtly bring division through words, and watch this, through compliments. See how I can begin to bring this down. I think I'm going to do an illustration here. Last scripture, guys, in the back. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 and verse 29. We'll read just three verses there. There's so much of what God has shared in this message that I tell you, man, if I had this <laughs> in some past seasons of my life, I know it would have saved me so much heartache, saved so much wear and tear on my family, on my life. And this is the benefit that you get to learn from my errors my mistakes, my experience. You get to learn from my triumphs, my victories. But ladies and gentlemen, you will never be able to get away from relationships. You're going to always have relationships. It's with your sister, your brother. And that one that was raised with you. Maybe it's a stepbrother, stepsister, half brother, half sister, brother in law, brother in love, sister in law, stepmom. Your son or daughter that maybe the relationship was estranged and you just trying to get it back together. We're all going to always be in relationships. And I'm just so happy that God would take this summer, the summer of 2024. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to elevate you. Because if your relationships don't get better, you're not getting better. God says, I care about what other people say about you. So I need you to live in such a way so that their remarks about you are remarks. Jesus said, your good works, I want men to see your good works and give glory unto me who's in heaven, but I want them to see your good works I want them to see it. Before I read the scripture, Mari, just give me a, uh, some minutes and then help me out with something in the back. But Proverbs says a good name is rather to be told. Do you not care about your name? Every relationship you're in, work relationship, family relationship, career relationship, romantic relationship, common relationship, is still, but your name is on that. Your name is on that. What's this last scripture here today, church, in Mark? Jesus answered him and said, the first of all the commandments, 
is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 30. And because of that, out of that, you shall love the Lord your God. And some of one of you ministers or prophets, preachers, got to teach on this one day, please. You've got to love the Lord. I want somebody to teach the church how do I love the Lord? What is the difference between loving the Lord with my heart versus loving the Lord with my soul? What is the difference between loving the Lord with my soul and loving the Lord with my mind? What is the difference between loving the Lord with my mind and loving the Lord with all of my strength? Stay right here for a moment, guys. This is a commandment. God is saying there's four dimensions I expect you to love me out of. And we're, I love God. Is that the mind, the soul, the strength? God is saying, I, eh. there's aspects of me that I'm complex and you got to love me in realms. You got to love me in strings because I'm so much of a big God. Love me with, with all your heart. Love me with all of your soul. Love me with all of your mind. Hmm. Nobody else in the world God commands us to love that way but him. Love me with all of your heart. The heart, the center of who you are, the thing that makes you up, the thing that makes you, you love me out of that place. Love me with, with all of your soul, your emotions, your feelings. Don't give your feelings to the world. Love me out of your emotions and your feelings and your passions. Love me out of your will and your desires. Love me out of that. Your mind. Jamie, tell my people that they should love me with their thoughts and their thinkings and the things that they ponder. Love me with your meditation. That's why the scripture says, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, we have a mind to remember his goodness. Is that not what Diamond was praying this morning? That list from Joseph of all the victories that God has done. God, I, when I think of your goodness, when I think of all you've done for us, when I think of all you've done for me, when I look at where I am, and I'm like, God, if it had not been for you that was on my side, where would I be? I would have been lost. I would have been destroyed. I would have been, the gunfight would have took me out. The glove fight would have took me out. The car accident would have took me out. The sickness would have took me out. But because of your mercy, because of your goodness, because of your grace, oh, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, when the medicine wasn't working, when the doctor's prescription did me none better, and all I could do was cry out in the middle of the night when I think of the goodness of Jesus I praise God for my mom and my daddy but when I think of the goodness of the Lord thank God for my church brothers and sisters but when I think of the goodness of the Lord I praise the Lord for my friends but when I think of the goodness of the says love me with all of your strength it was like the immediately the Holy Ghost said to me Jamie he's not talking about your available strength no! I'm not talking about the strength that you have left over 
you love me with every morsel and fiber. Watch this. God said, love me even if you don't have nothing else left over to love anybody else. But because I'm the God of love, you can't love me and I not replenish you at the same time. But love me first. The prophet said, make me a cake first, God, with all your strength, with all my might, God. No, we won't serve you in partiality anymore. We won't give you fragmented love anymore. He says, when you love me like that, watch what will happen with your relationships. Next verse. And the second one is like it. Now you can love your neighbor, your co-worker, your family member, your child, your spouse. We got it wrong. We trying to love people and then say, God help me. No, no, no. God said, no, no. Love me first with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. Then you will have the capacity for the ones everybody everybody is not living a life that will make it easy for them to love but he said James as long as you get the order right you can love the one you thought you never could love. You could forgive the one that you thought you could never forgive. You could extend mercy to the one that you thought you would never extend mercy to because now you've moved out of phileo and eros and storge into agape. Love now. You're, you're loving in your relationships the way God wants you to love. Yeah, God. Yeah. We got to love from a different place. We got to love from a different well. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. You can love somebody out of hell. Love them through the shame. Love them through the embarrassment. Because it's not a human-centric love. Get the relationship with me right. And you'll find yourself being less stubborn in those other relationships. You'll find yourself being more giving in those other relationships. Baby, I shouldn't have to say this, but there's some of you in here. <coughs> your, there's some key relationships that God says you better not let this one fall apart. And you need to come here to this altar and bow yourself before him. You've tried it in your own strength. You've tried it in your own way. And God says, now you heard my word, you respond. My goodness. Bring worship into the, relation, into the relationship scene. I've had so many singles come and ask me and my wife, how do I know if this is the, one, the woman for me? How do I know if this is the man for me? Have you worshiped together? Because worship will reveal. Worship will reveal. Worship will reveal. Come on, maybe you're bowing because of a broken relationship with a parent or with a loved one. But God says, watch this now. As you kneel, don't be quiet. You kneel, you bow, and you say, Father, I trust you. You cry out to him in this moment. You cry out to him, God, align me with your will, with your purposes, God. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Can we just get a spirit of worship in this house today? Can we just not spectate? Can we just begin to lift our hands if we can? Can we just begin to... If, if, if you don't need anything, speak for somebody else. 
If every relationship is right in your life, can I ask you to pray for somebody's uncle? Can I ask you to pray for somebody's aunt right now? Come on, can you do that? If all is right on your plate, amen, begin to intercede for another family, another relationship that is out there, that business relationship that God wants to be turned into a kingdom relationship. Pray into that now in the name of Jesus.